Hey everyone, welcome back to Cyber Gray Matter. Today we're talking about the cybersecurity incident response lifecycle and going over some elements of an incident response plan. By the end of this video, you'll learn about the different types of IR lifecycles and what could happen during an incident. First, let's define an incident and also talk about some other things called events and alerts. First, an event is some type of change to the environment, but this could be pretty much anything at all. A successful login, email change, or group policy could be considered an event that's recorded in a log. An event isn't a sign of malicious activity, but it could be. And remember that all alerts are incidents and events, but not all events are incidents. An alert is a notification for an event that potentially requires action. This can be an indication that some sort of threshold has been reached, or the system is giving a warning of a change or failure. Many organizations will fine tune these alerts to the scene, also known as security information and event management. An alert can be something malicious, but security professionals will make that determination. Now there are two types of incidents we're going to be talking about because I think it's good to make the distinction between things like this that have the potential to happen every day. There's an incident that's sometimes distinguished with a small i, meaning it's something that violated something in the CIA triad, which means something related to confidentiality, integrity, or availability, but the incident didn't have a business impact. An example of this would be that you had an employee who downloaded a PDF from a phishing file, but the malicious payload was stopped by the intrusion protection system. It occurred on a single host, and there wasn't any damage to the organization. Then we have something called an incident with a capital I, which is something that also violates the CIA triad, but the incident had a business impact, such as an issue that causes an important server to go down, which would affect the availability. So, what is an incident response lifecycle in cybersecurity? There are two main frameworks, one from SANS and one from NIST. The incident response lifecycle is a set of steps and phases within an incident response plan. And an incident response plan is a document that contains a set of instructions for a business during a cybersecurity incident. These instructions follow a specific set of steps, but the actual contents are going to be specific to that business. The document is designed to be a guide for a company from the very beginning before the incident even occurred, all the way to the last phase of finding out how the incident happened and how to prevent it in the future. Let's briefly contrast and compare the differences between the SANS and NIST frameworks. They're very similar and only grouped and worded differently. It's good to know how to organize both because a future employer could request or require you to use either or. As you can see, SANS defines phase two as identification, but NIST calls it detection and analysis. Containment, eradication, and recovery are all bundled into one for the NIST lifecycle. Finally, post-incident response falls into the same category as lessons learned. We'll define these more in just a moment. For this video, we're going to be doing it in the form of the SANS lifecycle and go through each of the six steps individually, and hopefully this makes things easier to understand. Step one is preparation. The first step is talking about developing the incident response plan itself. The worst thing would be trying to figure out what to do while an attack is in progress, and that's never the time to figure out what to do while the incident occurs. It's much better to have something set up and organized. The organization includes things like getting your people ready and trained, identifying skill sets, and having the procedures and policies in place, along with having the right tools or knowing where to get them. Some companies aren't equipped to handle the full-fledged cybersecurity incidents, so they may have a firm to help. It's vital to have a relationship and proper communication plan with a selected firm instead of scrambling once that time comes. Step two is identification. This is a step where you would try and identify any abnormalities or unrecognized changes within the network. This step relies heavily on awareness and having the ability to identify whether something is an incident or not. This is done by looking at log files and other alerts from an IDS and firewalls. Something that could turn into an incident could be something like someone calling to report that their computer is acting oddly. Something that might set off alarms could be unusual processes, new accounts with privileges, unusual files, and scheduled tasks that are outside of the norm. Step three is containment. At this point, the focus is on the short term, and you should begin alerting management. This is also where the incident response handler is assigned and starts the process. You must stop the bleeding and prevent any further damage and determine the criticality of the situation and categorize, while also containing whatever is affected. Before taking a system completely off the network, it should be determined what might be going on. If a system is vital to a business operation, impulsively taking something offline before understanding the event could have a more detrimental impact on the business. That's why containment might not be completely taking a system off the network, but it could mean isolating it in its own VLAN in order to monitor or cut it off from other systems to prevent further infection. 
Another thing to keep in mind is that isolation versus completely taking something offline is that adversaries might be made aware that you know they're in the network, and it might be better to monitor them. When you isolate it in a VLAN, the endpoint is still in the network, so it will still appear to be connecting to the C2, ultimately making the attackers believe everything is fine. This may not be an option if they've made it into an area with sensitive data, or the attack surface could make eradication worse. Step 4. Eradication. This is the phase where you remove and begin restoring affected systems to start to work on a long-term solution to the problem. This could be figuring out the root cause and removing the malware from the systems by re-imaging. During this process, the network will be rescanned in order to find any potential footholds on other hosts. Depending on the scenario, someone may create scripts to locate and delete related artifacts and apply the necessary patches to prevent future exploitation. Overall, this is the beginning of the rebuilding and fixing the damage. Step 5. Recovery. Now it's time to start reintroducing affected systems and bring them back onto the network. However, this isn't as easy as just a simple re-image and restoring from backup. Things need to be monitored and tested to make sure there isn't going to be reinfection. In the case of a serious incident, and while the process is in motion, the Cyber Incident Response Team, or CERT, will be involved to ensure things are safe, along with other system operators and owners. Finally, step six, lessons learned. This is considered the most critical phase of all because you're finalizing documentation and figuring out what to do to prevent these things in the future. This is done immediately after the recovery phase and involves an executive summary and an after action report or AAR. As for the report, this will be the explanation of the who, what, where, why, and how, as these will be discussed with everyone involved. It's important to include that this isn't a blame game and it's about addressing the process of how this occurred and not what an individual did wrong. It's also an opportunity to discuss the response effectiveness and how it could be improved in the future. This is also very beneficial because documentation will be used in training for future team members. And that's the end of the video. I hope you have a better understanding of the incident response life cycle and have gained some insight on the differences between events, alerts, and incidents. I'd love it if you left a like on the video and dropped any thoughts down in the comment section below. Thanks for watching.